So I just start with a very unusual case. So this case, basically a 22 year old uh, a man attended hospital. Uh, basically there is a long history of abdominal pain and vomiting. And this patient concurrently reported uh, uh, non-intentional uh, weight loss, fever, night sweat, and no other, any other uh, symptoms or any other systemic problem. And this patient had extensive travel history uh, throughout the North America and Europe. And uh, when this patient came to the hospital, on the clinical examination, uh, the findings are there is a mild abdominal pain, uh, bilateral flank pain, and all the systemic examinations are unremarkable. Patient is febrile, uh, but otherwise looks normal. On lab parameters, there is an elevated CRP and uh, elevated WBC count. And uh, sorry, on WBC count and other uh, lab parameters are the normal limit like LFTs, RFT, urea, creatine. And of course, the serology of HIV was also negative. Admission chest X-ray was normal. So, uh, so the basically uh, not getting any particular clue. Basically, so the patient was posted for CT abdomen, and the CT scan of the abdomen demonstrated a large paravertebral septated collection, and there is a associated scalloping of the vertebra. And uh, after the follow-up CT, there is a also it reveals that there is a cranial extension of the previously described collection to the level of T6, T7 space. And this is the, you can see the CT scan of the same patient. You can see uh, the, the collections around the vertebra, which is quite obvious. And uh, there is no other, uh, you can show uh, other uh, major abnormality or the pathology noted in the CT scan. So as a routine protocol, the, uh, the, there is, uh, the, the fluid was being drained. Uh, with pigtail guidance and the PCR of the drain fluid, it will mycobacterium tuberculosis. And uh, uh, the PCR test has been sent and AKT has been started. But unfortunately, two days after starting the AKT, the patient deteriorated again uh, with hemodynamically both having fever episodes, hypotensions, and tachycardia. And because of that, he was shifted to the ICU for aggressive fluid resuscitation. But the patient was not requiring any inotropes. It got settled with the fluid resuscitation. That time you see his WBC count was 25,000, his CRP has jumped to, to 33, and his lactates were high despite giving adequate fluid. This patient has also reported malaise, fevers, but all the system examinations were normal, and uh, the blood culture, urine culture, and other things didn't uh, grow anything. No bacteria was grown. So uh, this the point of confusion is like whether you are treating a sepsis, treating a septic shock, or it is like any other issues, like it is some shock of undetermined etiology, is a challenge because you have grown the bacteria tuberculosis. So, so basically the new definition are coming like uh, the previous definition, the severe sepsis, the terminology is out. Now the newer definition, uh, either it is sepsis or septic shock. So sepsis is like organ dysfunction caused by disease response to infection. Subset of sepsis where there is and uh, metabolic abnormalities are, uh, severe that substantially increases the mortality. Now, all these terms like sepsis and severe sepsis, sepsis has been removed, and in fact, septicemia has also been removed. Next. So what is the epidemiology? So epidemiology we see uh, particularly next. So if you see the global prospect, the sepsis contributes to overall half of the hospital death. And almost uh, more than a millions of Americans have suffered from the sepsis and more than 20 billion rupees are being spent annually, particularly in the United States. And it is one of the leading cause of, uh, you can say, the readmission and 75% of more hospital stay in the ICU than any other condition. This is our global data. And now once we see the Indian data, next. So this is the Indian data. So in, uh, according to Indian data, sepsis is a major cause of mortality and morbidity. It is the second leading cause of death and in the worldwide. Epidemiologically, data on the sepsis can mostly from the Western literature because our Indian data are very, very few. And we have very few studies from the Indian prospect, particularly this study. Actually, this study was in 2017 in one of the Indian ICU by the uh, Dr. Chatterjee et al. and uh, by Dr. Todi. So this study highlights the epidemiology of sepsis, particularly in the Indian prospects. So you can see that epidemiology of adult population of sepsis in the India, particularly the study has been carried out till 2011 and 12. 
and this is a single center study with more than five years of experience. Okay, and this is a quite a large number of sample sizes there. So if you see in this study, next. So we can see basically what are the different causes of sepsis in the Indian population. So next, so particularly if we go to the next uh, this slide, if you can see that the prospective study between 2006 to 2011, and almost we see the all the patients were admitted during the last five years, they are more than 18 years of age, and the data are obtained from the hospital in the patient record, and they have basically measured all the variables in terms of severe sepsis, ICU stay, hospital stay, 28 day mortality, the median length of stay, and they have taken the patient on the basis of aperture score, infection score, the site of infection and microbiological profile they have analyzed. And uh, what are the results? Or you can say that is uh, the search is not because of the sepsis, along with organ dysfunction, and basically you get a uh, culture positive and the, the, those patients are actually sepsis. So if you see 6%, actually 6 to uh, you can 10% are challenging patient where you can get the uh, you can get the culture positivity and you can get the actually the sepsis profile. Rest of the patient that is you can either classify based on their. So if you see the num if you see in this study, so basically what are the characteristics of such patients? You can see that all mean average length of stay in the hospital stay, the ICU stay, the apache two score, everything is more in the, the, this kind of patient. Most of the patients they died in the ICU actually. They are died within 28 days in the hospital. The median duration of hospital stay is in the range of 15 days. You can say the median hospital stay from the diagnosis of severe sepsis is almost seven to eight days. So after eight days, these patients are being uh, diagnosed with proper sepsis. So that is why the diagnosis is a challenging. You can see the post-operative admission rates are not very low, almost in the range of 50%. So that is the reason if you see the ICU mortality, the hospital mortality, the 28-day mortality, it is almost in the range of 56%, 63%, uh, and 62%. So that is the reason if you see the 28-day mortality also, it is quite high in the range of 63% respectively. So most common site of sepsis in this study is basically the respiratory tract. You can see the respiratory tract out of this, they have isolated the sample. And lung is one of the commonest site of infection followed by intra-abdominal or abdomen, then blood, then urine, then skin, then any other part like gynecological part, the CNS, the infection suspected, but source is unknown also is there. And there is a very little source of sepsis in case of bone and joint infection. So, so as per the study next, so as per the study, so if you see most of the patients who are coming to the hospital are mostly having pneumonia or some kind of your respiratory tract infection. And from here also, you can easily find that these are most of the times the microbiological profile of such cases, you find all the MDR organisms. So particularly the acinetobacter, the pseudomonas and the E. coli. So these are the three uh, atypical bacteria which are there, particularly in such kind of patients. So this is a very eye-opener study, actually Indian study. And if you see the attributable mortality rate is in the range of 85%. Oh, and you can see the median predicted death rate is 40 to 50%. The attributed mortality rate is 85%. The, uh, the standardized mortality rate ratio in the hospitalized population or ICU population is in the range of 1.4%, which is quite, quite high. Okay, That is the reason the sepsis is one of the important cause of mortality and morbidity. So the conclusion is that the ICU mortality is high in this group and a care is also you can see that lot of resources are being utilized and wasted in resuscitating such patients and particularly patients where you find that the outcome is futile because when the patient came to you with a shock state, most of the times you find that the outcome is poor but still uh, the lot of resources are being spent, particularly the ICU resources, the bed, the number of beds are being allotted to such patients and a needy patient actually who needs such bed instead of this patient, actually that, that is where, the, where is the challenge actually. The second study, basically the studies, the recent study also, it is, this is from uh, multicentric study. The last study was a single center study. This is a multicentric study. Particularly, this study is from uh, uh, either different hospitals across different ICUs and uh, involvement of all the critical care specialists across India. And you can see this is uh, one of the very famous studies that is called the Indicap studies, where they have actually classified the ICU subset patients who are having sepsis. 
and their cause. So uh, basically, this is an observational study, and it is a point prevalence study. So this has been performed between 2010 to 2011, and uh, across 124 ICUs, and they have basically observed their ICU patient characteristics, and uh, the all the uh, uh, your vital parameters are recorded throughout the 24 hour of the study and the data were analyzed for 4038 adult patients. The sample size is quite big across all the ICUs. And this is also a very important eye-opener study actually. Uh, next. So if you see this study, so particularly the patient were coming to the ICU, particularly for the medical reasons, you can say almost the 10% patient had sepsis or you can say the septic shock because now the severe sepsis is being removed, you can say out of all the patients of different complaint, the cardiovascular complaint, respiratory complaint, the sepsis particularly is 10%. Yeah, I can say it's, it is more than that, 10 to 20%. So among the medical populations, okay? So that is the reason the uh, the incidence of sepsis is very, very high. And if you see their Apache score, ICU, uh, the uh, particularly the Apache score is also very high for such patients and particularly the hospital length of stay, the ICU length of stay, everything is actually very, very high compared to the other conditions, particularly patient who come from, uh, the, who comes for heart disease or comes for respiratory tract infection, or you can say the other gastrointestinal problem. So that is the reason the incidence of sepsis is very, very high. So almost you can say, if, as per the study, there are 29% of the patient had severe sepsis or septic shock during their ICU stay or hospital stay, okay? And uh, these patients are having more one or more comorbidity and uh, septic shock during the ICU stay, the incidence, they have, what they have found is almost 1,140 per patients. That is, comes to around 28%, okay? In terms of the numbers actually, okay? And uh, of course, this is the observations which is recorded in this data actually. So, uh, and if you see basically these patients, particularly the severe sepsis, the septic shock, and all these uh, patients, if you see the uh, their duration of mechanical ventilation uh, and their other comorbidity, the reasons for medical admissions, their SOFA score, the Apache score, everything, everything basically is at highest risk and the risk of mortality in, indirectly increases as per this study actually. Next. So almost, so the conclusion is that the high proportion of uh, the sepsis, particularly the association of septic shock at public hospitals, particularly and the inadequately equipped hospitals is a challenge because the mortality has important implications for critical care in India. So the pitfall is that most of the times there is a delay in recognition of the sepsis. There is underappreciate the mortality in most of the times and failure to respect is time in such case because time is vital organ, time is the uh, need, uh, the time is the basically the early treatment and that is most of the time missed because the diagnosis is always being confused with some of the mimics. So now we are going to uh, see, so basically why there is the, the diagnosis of sepsis is a challenge because you see the definition has evolved from 1991, but there is no uniform definition. In 1991, if you see, Basically, sepsis is defined as a pathological process induced by microorganism. And they have included both patients with SARS as well as patients who are having infection. Okay, and same, this same definition from 1991 has continued till 2012, where they have included other terms like SARS, sepsis, severe sepsis, and septic shock. But now this severe sepsis and SARS is almost out. So the recent 2016 sepsis 3 definition, which is the standardized definition across the world, actually they have pointed, pointed out that what differentiates sepsis from infection or sepsis mimic is an aberrant or dysregulated host response. And that host response is because an host response leads to organ dysfunction. And that is because of the presence of infection. So one is the presence of infection. Second is dysregulated host response, and third is the organ dysfunction. So these are the three important variables you should consider while taking sepsis or septic shock into the pictures. So if you see the mechanism, basically there is a invasion of the microorganism in the body, 
that leads to disturbance of the first layer of immunity, that leads to trigger of the inflammation, that leads to microvascular insult, that leads to activation of the coagulation system, that leads to organ failure, ultimately MODS, and the theory will continue. So what is what we need to know? Yes, uh, please next slide. So what we need to know basically that when the pathogen, any bacteria, virus or fungus invade the blood, that leads to activation of the monocyte, that leads to activation, that leads to release of the cytokines and tissue factor. The cytokines cause inflammation and the tissue factor cause coagulation. That is the reason sepsis is a combination of inflammation, coagulation and infection. So this is the basic pathology of the sepsis. So if you see the presence of bacteria in the blood is called bacteremia, but infection is actually this chemical reaction which happens in the body because of the presence of the bacteria that is called the infection but when this infection becomes dysregulated or the infection is not controlled by the body's own mechanism that leads to sepsis okay and that leads to septic and that when this uh, infection is dysregulated that causes the organ damage because of the lot of release of the chemical mediators and ultimately that leads to septic shock and the death so you can see all these four Globes or these four pictures are overlapping. You can see there is overlapping of infection, sepsis, the SARS response, and of course, there are a lot of conditions where the body can produce SARS response in the absence of infection, like pancreatitis, in the burns, in the trauma, in other conditions. Actually, that looks like sepsis, but actually it is not a sepsis because you find a SARS response or systemic inflammatory response syndrome, but there is no infection. There is no bacteremia, there is no dysregulated host response because of the infection. So that is the reason the confusion lies here and to identify sepsis versus the sepsis mimic. Next. So this is where the recent papers 2024, the sepsis mimics among the presumed sepsis patients and the ICU. It is a very important retrospective observational study, particularly the Western study. Okay, and uh, I'll describe this study basically. So they have clear cut mentioned about the sepsis mimic. So uh, if you go to the next slide, particularly uh, we can see here. Now we can see here basically whenever the patient comes to the ICU. So what we initially thought is sepsis is called the presumed sepsis, but ultimately after the after the laboratory investigation, after the markers, biomarkers, you find after the bacteria is being isolated from the blood you actually confirm the sepsis. But what you also know that there is a subset of patient whom, where even if they behave like a sepsis, actually they are not sepsis and those are called the sepsis mimic. And the challenge is to screen the sepsis mimic. Why there is a challenge to screen the sepsis mimic? Because there is no gold standard definition of sepsis till yet. Only we are taking the sepsis in terms of the infection criteria. If you see the sepsis two criteria, sepsis three criteria, the sepsis 3 criteria, which is a recent criteria that basically focus on suspected or verified infection plus organ failure, which is actually is also not a gold standard criteria. So there are a lot of criteria previously in the ICU, basically to, uh, you can say, confirm about the infection. So in the old days, days, it is the physician suspicion of infection. So they are taking into account whenever the physician suspect infection, they are giving antibiotic. But sooner or later, they have realized that this criteria is actually not a very good criteria because most of the time this is being biased by the physicians. So uh, before, so in the worldwide, there is a uh, single most criteria to evaluate for the infection that is called the Linder male hammer criteria. So LMCI criteria. So basically there are, they have taken 11 variables as per the different organ system starting from the lungs, brain, heart, kidney. And as per that, they have classified the patient as per the infection score and as per the examination finding. So if in some some cases they have they find that there is no infection, some cases as per the LMCI criteria, they have found that there is a possible infection. Some criteria as per the LMCI, they have found that there is a probable infection. And in some patients, they have found out as per this criteria, there is a proven infection. So what we are concerned about is the proven infection and probable infection. If there is no infection, the sepsis is out, okay, as per this criteria. But we know that this criteria is also not appropriate or widely validated because this you can't like, uh, does not rely on the microbiological test results. 
it only depends on the your clinical scores and clinical accumbens and it is intended to be used actually in the particular in the icu but it can also be used in the hospital in the wards and also it can be used in other uh, uh, areas and this is a good criteria compared to the previous criteria of uh, calendar at all uh, the calendar at all criteria uh, and basically this criteria has a very good sensitivity and specificity but when we consider sepsis mimic actually most of the times uh, this is also 20 to 30 percent gives us a pulse positive result okay so that is the reason for whatever criteria you take basically most of the times the sepsis mimics are being missed and the proportion of sepsis mimic has only been analyzed in a few icu studies the studies are very very few and none of the studies are using the previous old uh, criteria like physician suspicion of infection but particularly most of the studies are now taking this lmci criteria in into the loop okay so uh, so if you see basically what are the different sepsis mimic so if you see these are the uh, these are the different uh, patients confirmed sepsis versus sepsis mimic so when you use so, so when you use the lmci criteria actually you can find the initial stage as per the sepsis 3 definition if you classify the patient you can see that almost 25% actually patients they are fulfilling the criteria of sepsis mimic when you taking into consideration of sepsis 3 criteria along with the shock you can uh, broaden your uh, sepsis patients diagnosis and there the sepsis mimic the area has narrowed down to 21%. Now, if you take another criteria, if you add that that uh, physician suspicion of infection or patient who have received four days of antibiotic, still you want you will get the better results. You can identify the sepsis patient much better way. Okay, I, almost in the range of 80%. But when you actually apply this altered criteria, LMC criteria, you can see actually your sepsis mimic patients, the numbers are increases rapidly, almost in the range of 29%. Versus if you use a liberal criteria, your sepsis mimic numbers have come down 14%. So that is the reason uh, this sepsis mimic uh, diagnosis is a challenging part because a lot of criteria that define different, different way. And sometimes when there is a confusion, the patient can fall either into this side or that side. And as per that, appropriate treatment uh, sometimes be missed and which is sometimes uh, can be proven very fatal to these patients, okay? So what is my take-home message is you apply a, uh, like a liberal criteria and rather treat a patient whom you suspect that this patient is having a sepsis rather than not giving a broader spectrum of antibiotic. Can you go to the previous slide? So basically, uh, this previous slide is a very important slide. If you see this from this slide, basically, you can see what are the different reasons of sepsis mimic they have classified as per the uh, organ system wise, respiratory system, renal system, gastrointestinal system, cardiovascular system. So as per that, there are different conditions actually which can resemble the sepsis mimic. Particularly if you see the respiratory conditions, particular patients who comes with collapse, comes your upper respiratory tract failure, Sometimes COPD, sometimes non-infectious COPD, hypertensive pulmonary edema, aspiration pneumonia, they can be misdiagnosed as actually sepsis patient. Patient with renal failure, acute kidney injury, sometimes you thought that this may be due to sepsis and actually these are the sepsis meaning. Sometimes like patients who are coming to you actually for reasons of heart failure, acute decompensated heart failure or some kind of uh, cardiac dysfunction, they can be sometimes missed interpreted as actually uh, sepsis, like AMI, your uh, something called as the, um, uh, your uh, uh, hypoxic uh, ischemic, uh, your uh, something called as your cardiomyopathy. Sometimes malignancies can resemble sepsis. Sometimes many neurological conditions, seizures, they can resemble sepsis, impaired consciousness. Sometimes IC bleed, they can resemble sepsis. So that is the reason most or one or more conditions can resemble the sepsis. Next. So you can see uh, from the next slide, you can see the these are the these are the different number of condition you can see, where you can see the most of the times they resemble the sepsis. So okay, so any shock of any etiology, pulmonary embolism, pancreatitis, your acute GI bleed, then something called as the uh, uh, your uh, pulmonary collapse, something uh, atelectasis, sometimes IC bleed, patients with diabetic ketoacidosis, 
patients with sometimes malignancy with tumor lysis syndrome, patients with sometimes college uh, your uh, nephropathy of unknown origin, acute kidney injury, intoxications because of many reasons, drug toxicities, drug or something poisoning. Those are the patients sometimes actually they mostly resemble like a sepsis, but actually uh, they are not a sepsis. So that is the reason you are uh, giving them not very uh, high antibiotics. Sometimes you can save your resources in such patients. Any febrile illness, malignant hyperthermia or hyperpyrexic syndrome. All these cases also sometimes because of the high fever, sometimes you may find that this can be a, uh, this can be misdiagnosed as actually a sepsis, but actually these are not sepsis. Next. So, so basically your challenge lies on your good clinical examination, your uh, good history taking and good laboratory finding, good microbiological cultures. And what we find basically between sepsis and pseudosepsis, basically the, if you see the clinically, that is mostly you do not find any kind of uh, difference, particularly both the patient can resemble uh, hyperthermic syndrome, the high temperature, low temperature, high pulse rate, low pulse rate, it can present in both the type of patients, both in sepsis, as well as pseudosepsis patients. Hemodynamic instability, you can find in both the category of patients. Peripheral vascular resistance decrease, you can find in both the category of patients. You can find this cardiac output, both in sepsis and pseudosepsis. Thyrotoxicosis, I also missed thyrotoxicosis. That is also one of the differential diagnoses. If you see the laboratory finding, that also mostly resembles most of the time between sepsis and pseudosepsis, like increasing lactate, decreasing albumin, deranged coagulation parameters. But what is the two important tests that you will tell you between uh, sepsis and pseudosepsis is actually the CRP and the procalcitonin. If there is a serial rise in the procalcitonin level particularly, sometimes this may point towards your sepsis, provided the patient is not having severe ongoing renal failure or cardiac failure or any other reasons like multiple trauma or severe heart failure. Particularly in a normal patient, if there is a serial rise in the procalcitonin, this is one of the very important pointer, along with the other inflammatory markers like CRP and interleukin-6. And of course, the gold standard is the microbiological culture where you find the bacteria. Once you isolate the bacteria from the blood, or you can say the sterile site particularly, the blood is a sterile site, it is highly likely that this patient is having a sepsis. Presence of bacteria in the unsterile site, sometimes it can be missed and uh, it, 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 it is not that much significant and sometimes it may be misdiagnosed. Most of the times it is being treated. Sometimes they may be a colonizer and you don't have to treat all these things actually. So the mnemonic is basically you have to check, uh, going on checking the lung, the urine, the CNS, the CVS, the abdomen, and also you have to suspect rule out any autoimmune things like arthritis, the spine and the skin problem to actually uh, classify this patient as a proper sepsis and not the pseudosepsis. Next. So this is what basically the, the study has been shown between the reliability of procalcitonin and the CRP in a septic patient, particularly you will see the value of procalcitonin, the red, red one is more in a patient of particularly the sepsis or confirmed sepsis, the value of CRP is more particularly in a patient of confirmed sepsis comparison to your uh, pseudosepsis and you see also WBC count some is most of the times it is marginally high particularly in a patient with sepsis compared to the pseudosepsis or sepsis mimic. Next. So that is the reason you have to do a proper uh, your uh, laboratory examinations uh, investigations starting from the x-ray ultrasound CT scan MRI brain and cultures of course. X-rays, so X-rays, the, the finding may vary depending on the things you suspect that sometimes you may find a similar X-ray in both the type of patients. Particularly, you can find the pulmonary mimics of sepsis, particularly any infiltrate you see, sometimes may not be a sepsis. Sometimes consolidation is not a sepsis. Patient may have pneumothorax, sometimes atelectasis or prolapse. Those are the conditions where actually you may find in the X-ray. Ultrasound also points towards your effusion. Sometimes patients with pseudosepsis, they have effusion, polycerocytes, ascites, plural effusion, and other pathology. But actually in a septic patient, you find typical mnemonic patches, the SRED signs, then uh, no signs of 
major fluid overload, particularly the B lines, sometimes may not be very high, which is actually very high in a patient of pseudosepsis or cardiac failure or pulmonary edema, B lines. Okay. So that is the reason to differentiate. When you don't know the source of sepsis, particularly when you suspect you have to sometimes undergo a whole body CT scan actually, particularly starting from the lung CT to the abdominal CT. And depending on the things, you may find the inflammation around the gallbladder, inflammation around the kidney, perinephric fat stranding, which particularly suggestive of pyelonephritis or infection or any kind of pathology like edematous gallbladder with stone. All those are things which you have to look for. In the brain, you have to also find meningeal enhancement. You have to find, look for the meningitis, sign of meningitis. And sometimes the CT scan will differentiate between non-sepsis versus sepsis or pseudosepsis, particularly if the patient has a uh, IC bleed or stroke, those kind where the patient is throwing fever, those also the CT scan will differentiate. MRI is not always required, but sometimes when you have a challenge, a diagnostic challenge, you may go for the MRI. Okay, particularly uh, now the T2 MRI, which is a, sometimes is employed for the occult deep-seated fungal infection. Always, always, 2 d also gives you a very good idea about the deep-seated infection, particularly infective endocarditis, your uh, endophthalmitis, you can see your ophthalmoscopic examination. Those are the hidden source of this sepsis, okay? So these are the things the 2 d can guide you. And of course, the final is the blood culture. So blood culture is, if you get a blood culture, cramp or your bacteria in the blood culture, that is always a confirmatory sign of sepsis. But negative culture, very, very important. Do not rule out sepsis. 30 to 40% cases, because of the antibiotic, you may get a negative culture. And sometimes you may get cultures or you may get bacteria from the non-sterile site, as I already told you, like sputum, like urine. And you don't have to interpret those things as a proper, you can say, you can say always as a sepsis, but sometimes they may be misdiagnosed depending on the clinical condition. Yes, next. So, so what are the newer molecular tests which will actually tell us probability of sepsis is more. So you have to send the pan culture, the colonizer, you have to differentiate and you have to assess for the antibiotic therapy. PCR-based tests are now more and more rapidly growing particularly the multiplex PCR, but the important challenge is sometimes this may give you a false impression of dead bacteria after the sepsis has settled down. So always, always positive multiplex PCR also do not rule out sepsis. Mild it off. The best part is this test will give you the report within a very uh, few hours compared to your blood culture. Mild it off usually gives you a report and next generation sequencing, particularly the NGS panel, which is a now uh, one of the important, uh, uh, you can say, uh, sepsis screening tool, particularly compared to the blood culture, because they basically do the multi-gene sequencing analysis at a time. In the multiplex PCR, you may get five to six bacteria at a time, but in NGS panel, you may get any bacteria or any kind of fungal infection if the fungus is there in the blood. So these are the new generation uh, tests for to diagnose sepsis, actually. Next. So this is what I'm talking about the NGS panel. So NGS panel is now the broad spectrum, uh, multiple uh, sepsis assay, basically what you should employ. Nowadays, most of the times, uh, these tests are being employed at our centers. And these are the one of the recent, uh, uh, you can say the upcoming tests in the pipeline, which sometimes may change the pace of the your sepsis diagnosis in the future. Next. So overall, so if you see ICU admissions, you go for a sepsis three criteria, then either you exclude the patient that they are not sepsis, is for the sepsis three criteria. But if you are including them, it's for the sepsis three criteria. So sepsis three criteria is infection plus dysregulated host response to infection plus organ dysfunction. You have to go for the presumed sepsis diagnosis. You send the blood culture. If you send the blood culture, if the blood culture comes positive, it is called the confirmed sepsis. If your blood culture comes negative, then you have to go for the screening of infection criteria that is called the LMCI criteria. So LMCI criteria just now I have discussed that holds good actually when there is a blood culture negative and you still suspect there is an infection. So you screen that is called the screening criteria of LMCI criteria. If your screening criteria, LMCI criteria or uh, lander may hammer criteria comes positive, the score is more than six then there is a probable or proven infection. Again, this patient will go into confirmed sepsis uh, uh, your bracket. If as per the uh, blood culture, it is negative, 
and as per the LMCI infection criteria also it is negative. Probably you can safely to certain extent 80 to 90 percent cases you rule out that these patients are actually pseudosepsis and not true sepsis. This is what the diagnostic algorithm in a, the ICU actually looks like. And I think uh, one should employ this algorithm actually in the clinical practice to improve the outcome. Next. And of course, now the best diagnostic methods are go still far ahead. The artificial intelligence we know, and it is going to change the scenario in the future world, particularly the gene, uh, the game changer, particularly uh, by analyzing the all the parameters at a time, it will give you a prediction model. So these are the called prediction model by the AI algorithm, whether this patient is having a sepsis or not. It will give you a fair accuracy, almost in the range of 80 to 90%. And this is actually going to help most of the intensivist and the clinician in the coming future. Okay, so this is all about the diagnosis of the sepsis. And this is the common sepsis mimic so one is the sepsis, second is the liver failure, third is the, which looks like sepsis, cytokine release syndrome, particularly the SARS response. In the COVID times, many of the patients, they throw this cytokine release syndrome, but actually you don't get any bacteria or you can you can say the proper infection or dysregulated host response. Pancreatitis is such a condition. Your anaphylaxis is such a condition. Diabetic ketoacidosis is such a condition. Adrenal crisis, of course, this most of the times looks like sepsis. Thyrotoxicosis or thyroid storm, that also, also looks like. Pulmonary embolism, acute decompensated heart failure, any kind of hyperthermic syndrome. So how you differentiate, this is a simple tabulation uh, form format I have actually uh, given it so that it will be easy for the clinician to understand actually. So most of the times it, it may not be missed by the clinical practitioner. So uh, with this, I'd like to conclude my talk, basically the sepsis mimics and uh, uh, hope and uh, happy to uh, take any questions. And sorry for the technical glitch. Actually, we have started a little bit late, uh, but uh, apology from my side, uh, but we are able to finish at time, almost in the time. Okay, so there is one question like, is there any criteria of CRP rise to assess the sepsis and mortality? I am not aware of, but of course, the rising trend of CRP is a bad prognostic indicator. CRP is a non-specific uh, inflammatory marker compared to the procalcitonin. CRP is basically pointed, pointing out that there is an inflammation which is going on, but actually it is not pointing towards the sepsis. Okay, it is mostly, uh, the, it is, has a high value in identifying the inflammation rather than infection. Thank you so much, sir, for taking your time out for us and giving such a wonderful session today. Uh, so I so request much. all the yeah. attendees uh, to post your questions or queries in the chat box of your session. We'll take your questions now. Sir, before we further move on to the questions, can you tell us any three take-home messages regarding today's session, sir? Yeah, so the three important take-home messages, one is uh, do not miss sepsis. Any patient who sometimes don't have a typical signs and symptom, symptoms of sepsis, you should not still able to miss it. Sometimes only the organ dysfunction is the only clinical signs which may be present. The second thing is give appropriate antibiotic at appropriate time within 45 minutes of ICU admission after sending the culture to prevent the mortality. And also do not use your all third generation or your broad spectrum antibiotics Whenever you are actually uh, finding it that this patient is not in septic shock or this may not be a sepsis, do not use your uh, waste your resources, particularly all your antibiotics. Okay, okay, that, that is a challenge. So these cases you have to apply your algorithm to identify the pseudosepsis. This is the three important take-home messages from my side. 